So um, I understand that you would like me to talk about um, our experience uh, as an academic institution working in the um, applied public policy work. And um, it's not something we um, teach academically, but policy analysis, it's something we've been doing in practice for these 20 years. So just I wanted to let you know that's how I'm going to approach this topic. So maybe I will just share with you our experience and also tell you a little bit about the context and so that you will decide for yourself if that's something that some if that's experience relevant for you or what you can learn from it. And I wanted to give some structure to this talk. And so first I will tell you more about our institution, the Andrian School of Policy Studies. And then I will cover three separate themes related to applied policy work. And one is about the practice, the difference between the practice of policy work as opposed to academic research. Then I will uh, talk about program evaluation as a sort of natural entry point for academics into, into the policy application. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the art of communicating our research to non-academics, say to decision makers. Uh, let me jump to the first one. I still cannot hear you. So if there's some, if there are questions or you want me to, to explain something, so maybe you can use chat function in the Zoom to let me know. So I'm, again, my name is Andrei Timofeev and I am faculty, actually research faculty at the Andrian School of Policy Studies. Andrian School is one of 12 colleges that we have at Georgia State University. The university itself was established more than 100 years ago, but the policy school is quite young, actually, was established in 1997. And it was also named after Ambassador Andrew Young. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, we, it's it, we're very fortunate to be aff affiliated with, with Ambassador Young. I don't know if you heard about him, uh, but he has a long and distinguished a career in public service. He started in the civil rights movement um, alongside uh, Martin Dr. King. And then he was the first African-American to be elected to the U.S. Congress from uh, Deep South. Uh, later, he was appointed as an ambassador uh, to the United Nations to represent the United States in the United Nations. After that, he served as a mayor of Atlanta, where our university is located, for two conse consecutive terms. And um, these days, he's still very much involved in policy work. He has, uh, so he leads um, a non-for-profit, um, foundation that is very much active throughout the world, sort of doing sort of uh, social in, uh, entrepreneurship. And he also very much involved in our institution. Um, and maybe I just let him talk himself, uh, just a couple of video, a two minute video. Okay, so now you know a little bit more about the name of our school and the Young School of Policy Studies, sometimes it's just abbreviated AYSPS. Even though the school was established only 20 years ago, since that time it has climbed the rankings um, pretty fast. So 
these days it's ranked among top 10 in various areas of uh, public policy. It is number five in public finance and budgeting, number seven in management, and also uh, ranked among top 10 in other elite areas such as urban studies and, and, and so on. And in particular, the school uh, houses a number of policy research centers that focus on policy reform areas in the United States <laughs> and also throughout the world. Uh, over these years, our faculty has worked in more than 60 countries on um, various um, reforms related to the public um, sector. Okay, and so the way it works is that the school is comprised of academic departments that are related to public policy. And we have um, these departments, they offer classes and award degrees. We have five de uh, academic departments, economics, public management and policy, urban studies, social work, and criminal justice. So as you see, all of them are in some way related to public policy. And so before, actually these academic departments, they predate the creation of the school. Uh, before that, if you go back 20 years, all these departments, they were scattered around different colleges. So my department of economics was housed at the um, College of Business. The Department of Public Management and Policy was at the College of Arts and Science. And until one day, somebody had a vision to bring all these departments dealing with public policy, to bring them under one roof and allow for synergy and uh, cross fertilization among all these disciplines. And so again, I, I, I'm affiliated with department economics, that's my background, but uh, I often uh, collaborate with my colleagues from other departments, from public management and policy. I understand that's the uh, area which is closer to you, but also work with other um, departments. Okay, so in addition to academic departments that's involved in teaching, we also have yeah. a dozen of research centers. Uh, research centers uh, are involved in applied policy work. So they're not involved in teaching. They have nothing to do with classes, but all they do are applied work. And often they engage faculty from the departments, but also they uh, have a lot of research associates that are not involved in teaching at all, but on only do research. So out of these uh, 10 or 11 research centers, there are three which are clustered together under the name of public finance research cluster. All these centers, they have something to do with public finance, with budgeting. And so the first one is Fiscal Research Center. Uh, actually, Fiscal Research Center, it's a kind of a outsourced, outsourced office of the state government because they do a lot of functions, we uh, perform a lot of, conduct a lot of analysis which are legally required for the state. Uh, for example, by law, every bill before it can be deliberated in the state assembly, it has to be accompanied with a fiscal note. And the fiscal note uh, makes an assessment whether this bill will have a fiscal impact, whether it will lead to increase in taxes or whether it will uh, require certain commitments for the government. And so that's the legal requirement. Technically, the state government could have developed capacity to do that in-house. But at that time, the decision was made that they don't want to have, to have that kind of capacity. So they would rather have a contract or outsource it to the 
um, Georgia State University, which is a state institution anyway. And so since the time, this Fiscal Research Center has been responsible for a number of analyses which are legally required. So, and another one is a state forecaster is housed in the Fiscal Research Center, which provides a, a forecast for the budgeting process at the state level. Uh, this, the second center, Center for State and Local Finance, it also focuses on domestic issues. It works with various domestic government agencies, state, local, and some federal. But its research agenda is more fluid. So, so for some, projects, they are approached by various state and local agencies who ask the, their assistance uh, to research uh, certain issues, to, to make an assessment. But sometimes the center decides to conduct certain research because it is of general interest. Maybe in their work with the state government, they would like to know more about the experience of other states. And therefore they decided to undertake a study of a best practice on something, on forecast, say, right? And finally, the last of the three uh, centers in this cluster, that's my center, International Center for Public Policy. We pretty much do the same kind of analysis as the first two centers, except that we do them outside the United States. So we, oh, Often we are approached by foreign governments, national, state, and local to help them with technical assistance or with capacity building, training, and, and, and that's what we do. And at the back end, there's a lot of uh, synergy. So in terms of, when, whenever we do some research, we, we might use the same database, we might use the same researchers as the domestic centers do okay so that's the the public finance research clusters all these research centers they deal with 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 uh, the uh, with the fiscal aspects but we also have other research centers we deal non-fiscal aspects such as georgia health policy centers it deals with public health uh, programs user workplace research group deals with the labor policies Georgia Policy Lab deals with education policies, nonprofit studies program, uh, studies NGOs, Urban Studies Institute deals with you know urban issues, and there is other centers which deal with law enforcement. Okay, and so since I'm going to refer to to the experience, to our experience working in the United States. So I just want to make sure that uh, you have some general idea about the structure of government in the United States. So you probably know that the United States is a federal government. And so at the top, we have one federal government, but then we have 50 states that used to be separate. Uh, and at some point they decided to, to join a union. And then within state, we have different kinds of local governments. And so what's peculiar to United States is that here local governments are creatures of the states. There's nothing in the federal constitution that talks about local government. And so each state decides on the structure and functions and um, scope of their local government. And so in each, each state, each state is divided in jurisdictions, which we generally call counties, probably there's something like your districts, but they can have different names. In different states, they're called differently. In some states, they're called parishes, in some calls, states, they're called uh, boroughs. But no matter wh wherever you are in the United States, you are in a county. So right now I am in the Fulton County. But in addition to having a county government, some parts of the county might also have a municipal government. So basically any part of the county can decide to incorporate, meaning that they would have to raise additional revenue, pay additional taxes, and then they would have additional services. And so where I am right now, not only that I'm in the 
uh, Fulton County, I'm also in the uh, city of Atlanta, which means that I pay, I pay more taxes than somebody who lives just um, 20 kilometers south, who would be just outside the city limits. He would pay taxes to the county, but he would not have to pay uh, his taxes to the city, but he would also not receive any services from the city of Atlanta. And in addition to this general purpose, uh, governments like counties, municipalities, and townships, we also have special, special, like local governments just for one function, just for one, like for education or for fire protection. They are local governments. They are elected, they have elected the representative branch, they have elected executive branch, they raise their own taxes, they are local government, but they only do one function, like school. So overall, throughout the United States, we have about 90,000 different kinds of local governments. And we at the uh, School of Policy Studies work with all of those, uh, all kinds of local governments. Okay, so that's the domestic side. So once again, if there are any, if you have any questions, if I, if I missed something, I omitted something, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, I will move on to the next, um, I mean, let me know in the chat or somehow, I, let me know. Uh, and then I'm moving on to my center, International Center for Public Policy. So as I mentioned, we do pretty much what our domestic centers do. We focus on the same issues, fiscal and non-fiscal, except that we, we have a different geographic scope. We work outside the United States. As I mentioned, we have worked in over 60 countries over the last 20 years. I personally have worked in about 20 countries or so. And um, so our name is a little bit way, uh, vague, right? Public policy. So generally, we are ready to happy with anything. So if somebody approaches us and they need help with particular uh, public policy issue, so we will reach out within our institution, be that um, budgeting or public health or law enforcement, we will reach out within in-house and find the right expertise. If we don't find the right expertise in-house, we'll reach out to our sister agencies, other universities in Georgia and, and beyond. And, uh, since you are interested to hear how an academic institution can be engaged in applied policy work, policy work, let me tell a little bit more about sort of our uh, modus operandi, how we operate. So it always starts when somebody reaches out to us for help. And because we work outside United States, most often we don't know much about the context. And so the first thing we always do is try to do the uh, diagnostic, try to understand what is, the con what is the problem and what is the context for the problem. And that is something that we believe strongly and something which I will reiterate throughout my talk is that we think that cookie cutter solutions, they just don't work. You cannot step off your plane, go to the meeting with the government and have a solution. It just doesn't work. It cannot work. So you always start with the diagnostic. So you try to understand what is the problem, what is the context. And then you collect your data and you go home and you do some homework, some analysis. And when you do the analysis, so there are two kinds of analysis you can do. One is that you can do given your time constraint, because usually when somebody asks you for technical assistance, they have a relatively short time frame. So for example, now is August, right? And so if somebody is asking for technical assistance, they would like to implement it starting from the next fiscal year, starting from July 1st. So it means that they want to hear something within three months by December then it would give them some time to evaluate options, deliberate internally. And if they decide to go ahead with certain 
intervention, then they will still have about six months started from January, you know, to draft laws, by laws, train, change the system, and so on and so forth. So that's the policy, that's the applied work. But often when we do this, this analysis, we realize that there is something that we don't have answers. And there's something that there's not much evidence even in the broader literature. Then we sort of make a note for ourselves. That's something we need to research deeper when we have time. And this is the second kind of analysis. Something that we can put on the back burner when we work on the project, but then we will come later, we will come back later. So after we have our analysis, uh, we go back to our client, to the beneficiary, and we present um, the options. And as part of delivery of our, uh, of the options, sometimes it also requires some, if not training, then some kind of policy dialogue. So we might be able to facilitate a policy dialogue, uh, especially if, if there is, um, if the political landscape is very fractured and so, different factions, they don't talk to each other. So sometimes it can be helpful to be an outsider. And given that we don't have a dog in this fight and we just try to, to present, have a neutral evaluation of the options and try to facilitate the dialogue. And everybody knows that we don't take sides. And then finally, if it is, if it is decided that reform is going to happen, then uh, we probably also stay involved in the evaluation. So well, it, isn't that part of the project or sometime later they invite us to come back and we help them to evaluate like one year later. Is, is the intervention working as intended? And then if something didn't work as expected, uh, if some results were not achieved, then it allows us to do some evaluation, try to learn lessons, and that completes the circle. So if something didn't work, then maybe we can learn something. And so when we go to the next project, maybe we can uh, avoid certain mistakes or have more options to, to, to offer. So that's pretty much how we operate. Uh, so let me pause again to allow for if there are any questions or before I switch to the next um, theme, let's put it this way. Okay. Can we switch? Okay. So the next topic I would like to mention is the notion of policy advice of policy advisors as clinician clinicians that's an idea that's not mine but i have heard different versions of it many times in the policy uh, circles and i think there is something to it and so that's why I, I would like to use this um, analogy to, to, to highlight certain aspects of applied policy work. So basically the idea is that um, doing applied policy work is pretty similar to say practicing medicine. In the sense that um, um, economies, or government systems, they are very complicated systems, just like human bodies are very complicated. Um, just like human body, you know, needs the proper uh, functioning of a nervous system, or cardiovascular system, respiratory system in order to perform. So same as a, say na an economy, a national economy, a local economy, or a government system. And if one system fails, that can lead to cascading of problems to other systems. Uh, 
And that's important because just like in medicine, right? When, when they, a person comes with a certain medical emergency and you look at him, there can be many things that's wrong with a person. You know, he might have high cholesterol and he also overweight and he's smoking. So he might have all those things, but you need to focus on, on, on the issue, which is the root cause of the problem of the, of, of the condition that he presented himself right now. And the same with, uh, you know, with national economies or local economies. There are a lot of, it's very complicated system. So there are a lot of things that needs to work properly. Energy, transport, finance, labor. Uh, and at any given time, you can find problems. Like here in the United States, you can find a lot of issues. Like we don't have a value added tax. Every country in the world has a value added tax. We don't. But it doesn't mean that, you know, we should stop everything and, 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 and try to, to get a value added tax adopted. No. So basically, even though there could be many issues, you need to focus on the underlying cause of a condition you are trying to address. A related uh, observation is that the same kind of symptom might have very different underlying causes, many, many causes. And different causes require different rem remedies. And that's another reason why cookie cutter solutions don't work. Because you have to pinpoint which problem, which is underlying issue is behind a particular symptom, right? So you have unemployment. There can be many, many reasons why you have unemployment. And, and, and for different causes, you will need different kinds of reforms. You have to pinpoint which of, those under, which of those problems are binding constraints and which really don't matter right now because there are other things that need to be fixed first. And, um, um, and what's important is that Sometimes it is impossible to identify one single cause, meaning there could be many causes and we can rule out many of them, but at the end of the day, we can still end up with several possibilities, one or two, hopefully. And these possible causes might require very different treatments, remedies. So then you have to do what's called differential diagnosis and you might have to continue under this differential diagnosis. Basically you say it could be one of the two, I don't know which one, and they require separate treatments. But if it's, if it's the first one and it's not treated immediately, there's going to be a major crisis very soon. Yeah, so I, yeah, will, yeah. I will start treating that one because if the other one, it can wait. So I will start treating the first one and I will see does it have an effect? Is it, does it lead to improvement? If not, oh, maybe it's not this one, maybe it's the other one, and then I switch. So that's called differential diagnosis, and that's uh, pretty much the way to do it. Uh, another important analogy with the medical field is that you have to consider the family ties, right? So when you have a, when a doctor has a patient, he also asks, you know, did you have heart problems in the family? He asks about this, the overall uh, situation in the family. Uh, because all that is important for many reasons. One is that it can help you with diagnosis, but it can also help you to choose the right remedy, the kind of remedy which would be feasible and something that the, the patient can sustain. Like to use a, a medical example, if you have, you know, uh, if you have a person, maybe a single mother and she has nervous breakdown, you know, because, you know, she's overwhelmed. She has to wake up early in the morning and, you know, maybe go to the market and, and, and sell something so that she has money and she come back and, 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 and feed her children before they can go to school. And then she has to stay up until late and she only gets a couple of hours of sleep. And as a result, she, has a, she, has, she is exhausted. She has a nervous breakdown. 
if you give her advice that she needs uh, she needs to take a break, it's not a very useful advice because in her family situation that doesn't work. So you have to come up with a, a remedy that is kind of feasible in her circumstances, in the circumstances of a particular patient. And the same in our field. So if if you when you consider various reforms or policy interventions, you should to consider what feasible in these particular circumstances. And that could be the circumstances of this country in terms of political situation, socioeconomic situation, and so on. It could be also more sort of regional issues. Maybe they have a lot of refugees or maybe something else and something else you have to consider. And that's very, that's very important. I, have my, I had my personal experience when I was working in one wow. Middle Eastern country and they had social unrest. They, they had a riot because of a policy proposal uh, that originated in the project I was working on. Fortunately, it was not my component, so I had nothing to do. But there was a riot, and so the whole country was locked down, and I could not travel there for several months because of the security situation. So that's important. So, so, so again, that's another illustration that you cannot just have just offer cookie cutter solutions. So everything has to be tailored specifically to a particular uh, situation. And the final observation is that whatever treatment, whatever solution or intervention you prescribe, you have to monitor, evaluate. So you cannot just you know, write a report, like in my, in, in my case, in the case of international advice, just write a report, uh, leave it and, 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 and hop on a plane. No, actually you have to be involved. You have to monitor to make sure that whatever solution you propose is actually working. If not, that maybe you need some uh, mid-term correction. Uh, okay, and the final observation, uh, which is probably more relevant for, in the case of international uh, policy advice, in my case, and maybe less so domestic, but also important. And basically it is, uh, the importance of maintaining high ethical standards because and that's the difference from academic research because in in the policy area the our whatever we do it affects somebody somebody can get unemployed somebody can suffer and um so therefore it uh it means that we have to be committed to do the best we can. We cannot just settle with easy solutions, even if we are working in a very limited environment where there's no data available or there's some kind of political thing going on and there's not enough buyout and it's hard for us to, uh, hard to work in this environment, but we have to, it's just like, you know, in, in the medical area, they have this principle, they, they, they take the oath, noli not sera, do not harm. It's pretty much applies to, to, to our field. Okay, uh, so since I mentioned the, the importance of differential diagnosis, I would like to provide another illustration so that doesn't sound too abstract. So maybe something a little more specific. So let's see, if we're talking about uh, economic development, local economic development or at the national level, <clears throat> so it is important to find what is the binding constraint. Because at any given time, you know, we can reform many things. And, and there is a caricature of, of an economist who, so, so some people think that we always advocate for trade liberalization, deregulation, uh, shrinking of the government sector. Uh, no, that's not true. Actually, we try to find the, the root cause of why some economy is underperforming, local economy or regional economy. 
and there can be very different reasons. So if you have a, a low economic activity, two possibilities. One is that maybe it's too difficult to obtain finance. And that also can have very different reasons. So it may be the entire country is shut off from the international um, capital markets. Maybe the country defaulted in the past or for some other reasons, uh, foreign investors think it's very risky. Or maybe the problem is with domestic financial system. Maybe there is no, the banking system is underdeveloped and there are no banking branches outside the capital. So, all, so these are very different uh, causes and they require very different intervention. And similar, if we go back to the top of the diagram, similar in the opposite case, where the problem is not the lack of financing, the problem is that there is no worthy application for investment. And that also can have very different reasons. It could be because it just, the, the, there is no way to invest. Basically, the, the returns to investment is very low. That could be because of the poor geography, like if, if we're talking a particular region, maybe because of the geography of that region, or maybe it would be a lack of human capital. You can find the people with the right skills, or maybe it's bad infrastructure. These are very different reasons and they require very different intervention. And it's very unlikely that each of them is critical. So most likely one of them is binding and that's the one you, you should address first. And so even if it, it, it might look like too complicated and um, overwhelming, but actually it is quite feasible to, to work it out. So because different possibilities, they would present themselves with very different symptoms or very different signals. So if the problem is the lack of finance, then you would see a lot of business business people with a lot of good ideas chasing lenders and the interest rates will be very high. And um, for example, that probably was the case of Turkey and, and Brazil some time ago. But if the cause is the opposite, if actually it's not the access to finance, is that there's no to invest it, then what you observe in terms of the signal symptoms will be completely different. You would see that the banks are awash with liquidity and they have no way, they have, don't have good loan applications and they just have no better uh, use for their money than just invest in government bonds, which might have very, very low interest rate, maybe negative, but they don't have anything better. So, so basically what I'm saying is that uh, it is quite feasible to walk through this di differential diagnosis. And the same, so this is the example of economic development, but also in, in other um, public policy problems. Okay, and next I would like to talk about another sort of policy analysis tool, which is used in practice. And I want to be careful because a little bit controversial. Uh, so this is benchmarking. Basically benchmarking is when you can try to get some ideas by comparing this country to another country. Um, by compare some very sort of basic indicators. And so in these graphs and illustrations, say we compare the tax to GDP ratio, the tax yield of the tax systems of different countries, in this case, to developed countries, Germany and the United States. And you see that their tax yield is very different. Uh, meaning that their tax systems are very different. The United States is well built below the average for developed countries. And Germany is quite above the average, okay? And this is an illustration that the graph itself, the benchmarking, doesn't actually tell you much. It does not help you to, it doesn't give you a, a, a diagnosis. But it can be helpful in pointing you to the areas of potential weakness. 
basically it can draw your attention to the areas may where you need to collect more data or maybe when you need to talk more with stakeholders try to understand what's behind that and as a result it might help you to uncover the underlying cause or might not and so therefore when used properly i think benchmarking can be useful but you need to be very careful not to misuse it because while it can while it can identify possible causes you know possibilities are not certainties and problems are not solutions so it's more of a something you do maybe at the very beginning like in like in my case when i arrived to a new country i've never been to and i just try to figure out what's going on that could help me. it could guide me in my process of assessment of the diagnosis but it will not give me solutions it will not give me the diagnosis it will not give me the solution it will guide it will guide the process it will help me to focus where i should be dig deeper and uh, since we're talking about tech about benchmarking to other countries so you might be interested you know where thailand stays right is relative to to other countries so in terms of uh, tax yield uh, tax to gdp ratio so you can see that you know uh, right now thailand is below both the united states and germany uh, the tax yield is less than 20 percent gdp in thailand um, and the united states is 25. does it mean anything does it mean that that's something that Thailand needs to focus on. Um, now, so there are probably, as based on the experience of United States and Germany, you can see that always United States has had lower taxes than Germany. And probably the reason for that is that these two countries have very different contexts and as a, the point that i was trying to make earlier that the policy solution have to be tailored to each particular context and maybe it's not surprising that the united states and germany have very different tax system because they have very different contexts even though they are in the same group of countries they are developed countries they are both federal countries and they are quite large and Germany is larger than many other countries. Still, you can see if, if you dig deeper, you will find out that there are a lot of differences. And that explains why the tax yield in Germany has been always higher than the United States. If you look back 50 years, and I'm pretty much sure if you look 50 years from now, it will still, the difference will be still there. And same with Thailand. So it's, so, it's true that the uh, Thailand is still has room to catch up in terms of the level of economic development and, and per capita income. And it's true that as um, the economies mature and the institutions mature, um, it is easier to collect taxes. So it's quite possible that sometime in the future, the, the, the tax ratio in Thailand will raise. But right now, I cannot tell if Thailand will become, the tax system in Thailand will become like Germany or just United States. Because it all depends on the context and the, Thailand has a very different context. And just not to be too abstract, there are specific factors of environmental environment that determine which tax system is appropriate for each country and let me briefly list those factors so first the ideas like if you if you go to different countries and you try to talk about taxes what they think is a good tax people have very different societies have very different ideas what is a fair tax what is a good tax you will be surprised here people hate value added tax left and right on the left they think that the value added tax is regressive on the right they think the value added tax is a tax machine and it will lead to the explosion of the public sector 
But if you go to another, if you go to European Union, like for them, value the tax, it's something that's very natural. Actually, you cannot become a member of the European Union if you don't have a value added tax. Uh, the balance of vested interests shape the tax system uh, because taxes affect differentially different segments of the society. For example, business, businesses versus labor, rural versus urban, young versus old. And to the extent that over time, the balance of those interests and political representation of those interests change, that makes an impact on the tax system. So the tax system uh, evolves in response. Public service needs determine the level of taxation. So right now, most countries have a great need for resources in order to uh, combat and mitigate the pandemic. And while some countries are able in the short term to borrow funds, eventually they will have to be paid off. So I would, wouldn't be surprised to see that many countries will have to raise their level of taxation in the next five years or so. The, the changing of economic conditions have a huge difference. You know, the economies of most countries, they undergo tremendous uh, transformation. Globalization, digitization, uberization. Well, you don't have Uber, you have Grab, but they change the way businesses operate. And because of that, they affect how we, the government, can reach those economic activities with the tax. <laughs> uh, and finally, administrative constraints and technological possibilities change, uh, public tax administration possibilities change. So these days, you know, Google Earth allow us in real time to see when there is some kind of construction or new development going on in our city. And that makes um, property assessment and reappraisal very, very easy. But I remember when there was time where the city of Atlanta, Fulton County, would have to do aerial photography. So you cannot do that every day. You would do it every five years or so. You would have to hire a company that would fly a plane and, and you know, take pictures. And so now it's much easier to keep the property valuation up to date. And and finally, the, the, the final, final point is that also cultural context also matters. Things like attitudes, attitudes to government, attitudes to taxes, that, deter that affects you know, how much taxes we can raise. But this is just an illustration that tax systems, there's no such a thing as an optimal tax system. You cannot just find best practice and just copy it. No, each country has its own context and it has to find the tax system in this case or other policy intervention which uniquely fits the context of a particular country or particular region okay so i'm going to move to the next topic uh, let me pause here uh, in case there are any questions or something i need to clarify And I hope you can still hear me because otherwise by now you will already let me know. Okay, uh, the next thing I would like to talk about is monitoring and evaluation as an entry point for us academics into the policy work. And even though Monitoring and evaluation, M and E, it just, it's used just like one word, M and E, M and E, M and E, M and E. But actually, these are two different things. Monitoring and evaluation, they are very, very different. Monitoring, it's about the tracking, the implementation of the project or the program. And basically, it, it, you're monitoring how the pro, what are we doing? how activities are implemented, right? This is something that government, government agency can do themselves. 
sometimes they need training, but that's something they, they, they easily can do themselves. They can uh, design the proper reporting forms, make sure that whoever implements the project, the program project, uh, submits the reports. If they don't submit that, you, you then you will pause the, the next disbursement of the funds. So that's something that governments can do. However, when it comes to evaluation, evaluation is different. So tracking, it's about what we are doing. Evaluation about are we achieving the objectives? There's a big difference between completing or implementing a program and achieving an objective. You can complete the program. You can complete all activities, spend all the funds, all checked, all, all reports submitted. But if you look at the objective, say if the objective was to reduce unemployment or to increase the number of, of small businesses or startups, there could be no change. Or, or more importantly, if there is a change Evaluation also require that we attribute the change to our program to make sure that whatever improvement we see is because of our program and it wouldn't happen otherwise. That's the attribution part. And actually this is quite hard and that's something that government agencies often struggle with. And in our case, that's where we always get uh, request for assistance from government agency to help them um, carry out a program evaluation. So once again, uh, the um, so basically ev evaluation for evaluation at the minimum, you have to to measure some um, indicators of outcome at the beginning baseline and at the end. But it's not enough just to look at the change in the, in the indicator. You have to compare that to the change that would have happened without the program. And then the impact, it's the difference. The change that happened during the program compared to what would have happened without the program. So only the difference, what happened, and the counterfactual, what would have happened. Only the difference can be attributed to our program and something that's called impact. And that's, as you can see, that's not that easy. It's easier to, to, to measure the actual at the beginning and at the end, but it's hard to measure the counterfactual, something that didn't happen, right? Because you either have program or you don't have a program. Or a, a, a individual or a municipality is they participating or not participating. So you don't know if you have if you know one, you don't know the other. So that's what is called causal inference problem, uh, because we cannot observe both. We cannot observe somebody after treatment, after participating on the program, and after not participating. It's either one or the other. We can observe two different individuals. We can observe two different municipalities. One participated, one not. And then we look at the different of outcomes, but then we don't know if the outcome is different because one participated, one not, or maybe because they are two different people and they have very different characteristics, right? So we, can, we do not observe counterfactual. And so we cannot measure the causal effect. And the only way to approach it is through statistical analysis. And there are two kinds of statistical analysis. One is less, less involving, less demanding computationally, but more demanding in terms of logistics. And the other one is the other way around. You don't have to spend too much money on collecting data, but then you have to spend a lot of time trying to to produce the estimate. Okay, uh, so the first one, it's called perspective, meaning that before you start implementing your program, you already have to design your evaluation strategy. 
so that you know what kind of data you have to collect on program participants and on the control group. Okay? And this can be expensive because you have to spend resources monitoring not only your participants, but also the control group. And, mean, and, and if the resource is limited, meaning that the resources that you spend on the control group, that there is resources that you did not spend on the actual uh, intervention. You could have enrolled more people in the program, but you didn't because you had to set aside part of your program on the evaluation design. On the other hand, what, all, what happens more often than not is that you have to do a retrospective uh, evaluation, meaning that the program already ended. They did not design a retrospective study. They were not collecting data on the control group. The only thing they have is monitoring data from the program participants, and you have nothing to compare it with. So then, you don't, since you don't have data, then you have to do more sophisticated statistical analysis, trying to come up with that counterfactual that you don't observe. And there are different kinds, difference in difference matching, regression continuity, and probably you need a lecture on each of those. Uh, but whatever they are, most often government agencies don't have capacity to do this kind of analysis, and that's why they reach out to us. So I don't know how familiar you are with either of the two approaches or which of them is more common uh, in, in, in your work. I, and if the uh, prospective study is something, if it's something that sounds too exotic, so maybe I could spend a bit more time. It is, it is still rare, um, but it's not exotic. Like everybody knows what it is. Uh, and ideally everybody has to make a decision. Do they want to do it or not? If they want to do that, they have to buy, when they plan the program, they have to budget, they have to set aside the resources for the randomized control trial. And so there are a few examples which, which eventually led to even academic publications in, in high-ranking journals, very famous publications, one in Indonesia, one in Kenya. But the idea is that, uh, as I mentioned, is that you have to randomly assign individuals or municipalities to either a program, either to program participants or the control group. And then, or, sometimes you randomize across the applicants. So maybe you, you randomize and uh, use different intensity of the treatment, and I'll have example, among participants. So that also gives you some, um, some idea. Uh, what is the benefits? Well, the, be the benefit is that when you observe the outcome, you know that the outcome, the difference in the outcome between control group and, and, and the treatment group is only due to the treatment, due to the program. Because everything else should balance out because we're randomly assigned, we're randomly selected both groups. And therefore, while it's true that each individual is different, but because you randomly selected them, so in the, as a group, they're very representative. Like they're short individuals, tall individuals. So when you take the average of the treatment group, it all balances out. The only thing is left is that the fact that they were treated. And the same in the control group. Because you randomly assign them, it makes sure that the group is very representative. So when you take the average of the control group, everything balances out. What's left is the average. And if it's different from the average for the treatment group, that's probably due to the program. Okay, some examples. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, if you want me to skip, just give me a sign. Otherwise, uh, I'll go a little bit more details talking about the randomized uh, control trials. Since it's still 
uh, new in, 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 in some areas. So this example in Indonesia, uh, so they were using the randomized control trial to see how effective is auditing in reducing leakage in, um, in, in investment grants to villages. So in Indonesia, they have 80,000 villages and they, even though they're not municipalities, they still have some kind of structure so that they come together and, and, and come up with certain project and they can receive funds. And so out of this 80,000, I don't know how many were actually uh, um, part of the program, but 600 of them were selected randomly to be either observed as a treatment group or as a control group. And the one in the treatment group were told that they're going to be audited. And while the one in the control group were not told they're going to be audited. But at the end, all of them were audited, all 600. So then they, they, they were trying to see if there any difference. The fact that they knew they're going to be audited, did it make any difference? And they found yes. So the leakage in, in the treatment group, those who knew that they're going to be uh, audited, the leakage was about 8% less and was statistically significant. So while statistically significant, 8% might not be such a huge number, for example, to justify complete auditing of all villages. But it's good information to have, right? So if you decide, you know, do you want to invest in auditing? That gives you some idea how much it will return in terms of reduced leakage. Okay. Another example from a completely different area of public programs related to uh, agricultural program. Uh, basically, a program that provides offers um, fertilizers and hybrid seeds to farmers in Kenya. Um, so basically, uh, the idea is to understand so the problem with the program that there was there was not sufficient uptake because the, the, the those inputs were not free. Farmers still had to pay for them. And so they try to understand why is that there is no uptake. Is it because that uh, intervention is not effective? The, the fertilizer doesn't make any difference or, or, or what? So to do that, uh, they had six trials, basically three years. And each year they had two growing seasons. So... You have two seasons per year, over three years, six trials. And for each trial, they had uh, the randomly selected farmers to be either in the treatment group who receive fertilizers or in the control group who don't receive fertilizers. And then at the end of the growing season, they would compare the yield. They would harvest and compare what's the yield on the uh, fields that were receiving fertilizers and compare that to the average yield on the fields that were not receiving fertilizers. Uh, furthermore, there was, uh, in the treatment group, there was also different intensities, intensities of treatment. So some of them were only receiving one uh, fertilizer, uh, calcium ammonium, uh, ammonium natrate, while others were in, in different dosages while some of them were receiving a full package of fertilizers plus hybrid seeds. And so as I mentioned, at the end of each growing season, uh, the, the maize was harvested and weighted, and then they were comparing the, the yield. So here are the result. So if we look just at the yield, and the yield is the average, the average uh, harvest, uh, the, the difference, how much, how much was harvested in the treatment group compared to the control group. So the yield, the, yield, the additional yield is always positive, no matter what, what the dosage. With, with the smallest dosage of a quarter of teaspoon, I guess per bucket, or, uh, so the yield was uh, 28%. If you increase double the dosage, then it's, uh, the yield goes to 47.6. If you double again, it increases, but by smaller uh, margin. And then if you use the full package, the yield is even higher. 
However, if you adjust the yield, if you take into account the cost of the actual inputs and you look at the net return, then you see that the relationship between program intensity and the return is not monotonous. It is increasing. If you increase the dosage from a quarter of a teaspoon to half a teaspoon, the yield is, uh, the rate of return is uh, increases from 4.8 to 36%. But if you increase it further, actually the additional yield does not cover the additional cost of the fertilizer. And if you use the full package, then actually you are in a big loss. Uh, some of the money, uh, you lose 50%. Uh, meaning that on each uh, dollar that you spend on fertilizers, you get back um, less than 50 cents. And so then the result that, so on average, uh, without fertilizer, um, you would get 8,000 uh, Kenyan shilling in, in the, uh, you would harvest, a, you would have a produce valued at 8,000 Kenyan shilling. But if you use uh, half a teaspoon, which appears to be the optimal dosage, then you would get one third more, 1,100. Uh, Kenyan shilling. And so the policy implication that when used in the right dosage, actually fertilizer can be efficient. However, and actually it can have, it can have a return 36% over one growing season or 69% over a year. However, other levels of fertilizer might actually be unprofitable and lead to a loss for the farmers. So that's the policy implication. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you about randomized controlled trials. Again, this is still less it's common uh, approach. Uh, most approaches are still uh, uh, retrospective, but it also means that they are more uh, computation involved and also less defensible when you try to, to when you try to communicate your evidence and say well this is a difference between what happened and what could have happened but what have happened you actually had to produce using very complicated math it's very difficult to communicate therefore with randomized controlled trials it's much much easier just explain this is the control group this is the treatment group that's the difference uh, very easy to communicate to policymakers. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk is about communication. Uh, so, the, I guess our research probably would have little value if we were not able to communicate it to others. Even in academia, right? So if we don't publish, we don't succeed in our career, at least in, 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 in the research field. We can still do good in teaching. Uh, so, so with policy work, basically it's the same. You have to be able to communicate your results. And the general, the principles are the same. So basically, the effective communication strategy is to tailor your communication tool to your target audience. So you need to, to understand who your audience, who are in your audience, what they already know. Do they already have opinion about this subject? maybe some misconception that you have to address. And then you have to have some idea how they consume information. And, and based on that, you would come up with a, with a customized communication tool. And again, just like with the, uh, poli with, with the policy, with the making proposal itself, with the actual research, 
everything depends on the context. And in different contexts might require different, different communication strategy would be more effective than in others. It depends on cultural context. In different cultures, people consume information differently. For example, they say that here in the United States, people don't have reading culture. People don't like to read. So that's why maybe we have to take that into account. But in others, maybe people like to read. They don't want to, they don't want to listen. So, so it has to be tailored. So the goal, the general rule is the same. You have to tailor your communication strategy to your audience. But to the extent that the audience can be different, means that that would require a different communication strategy. So from my experience, the way it works is that I work throughout my um, policy work, throughout the same project, I interact with different kind of counterparts. And for different counterparts, I use different way of communication. Most of my interaction is with a technical person. Usually it would be, for example, a policy advisor to a decision maker, a policy advisor to a minister or a policy advisor to a mayor. And with the policy advisor, things can be more informal and also I have more time. So I can spend some time and I can better understand, for example, maybe there's some term in English that just doesn't resonate in a particular um, environment. Eventually I will learn because I, can, I see the feedback. For example, I recently, I recently worked in Nepal and for whatever reason, they don't like the word subnational. Here, we don't want to say state and local too long. We say subnational government. In Nepal, they just, they don't like it. It just, I learned it. And then I say subfederal. I mean, for me, it doesn't matter. I would never say subfederal here, but if that's what works, Finally. So anyway, so what I'm saying that normally I work with a technical person and I spend a lot of time and through some back and forth and I get some feedback on whatever I propose. And eventually I get to the point where this technical person, where, where a decision has to be made, where this technical person has to take our proposal to the decision maker. And then he would ask me, can you give me a two pager that I can take to my boss? And then I would ask how exactly your boss takes the information. Should be more visual, more, more graphs, more tables. And he would tell me. And then I would make a two page, I would give it to this, to my counterpart. And he would himself would maybe bold something, some words, highlight, and then he would take it to his boss. So that basically generally how it works. But again, what's I think what is specific to, to the policy work, especially as you get closer to the decision makers is that you have less and less, you have more and more space and time constraint. And therefore, uh, what's very commonly used is a policy brief. So a policy brief basically where you only have two or four pages to communicate your message. And again, how to do that, how to, use that limited space more efficiently might slightly differ from country to country, from context to, from one context to another, based on cultural things and that. But maybe there are some general tips that I listed on the slide. And probably these tips are more attuned to the English speaking countries or Anglo-Saxon culture. Uh, but I think they also, to some extent can be adapted to other cultures. So it's very important to have an informative and engaging title. Informative means from the title itself, the reader should know what's it about. Unlike, you know, thrillers, um, you don't need to keep your reader in suspense, no. If, from the title itself should be immediately clear what's it about. And also it should be engaging enough. So it should not be sound too boring, right? So the person needs to want to continue reading. So if you manage to get the reader past the title, then essentially you have just 45 seconds or one minute of his time. So in the first paragraph, you have to get all your message across. What's the problem is, 
what's the uh, alternative solution, and what do you recommend? All that just in one paragraph. And the reason for that, um, because you probably familiar yourself, but where I worked with decision makers, whenever I come to the office, they have like huge piles of papers on, on, on their desk. And so they have to screen what they're going to read. So if after they read one paragraph, they think they're not going to waste their time, they're not going to waste their time. They just put it aside, say that I will read later, and they will never read it. So that's why the, f the first paragraph is the most critical. You have to get your entire message across in one paragraph. Then if you were successful and the, the reader continues, then you still have a page and a half to elaborate, basically to state uh, more clearly the, what the problem, why the audience should care, uh, describe the options, including the current option and what the possible alternatives and, and um, offer a neutral evaluation pros and cons for each of those options. And at the end, while not making a decision yourself, you can still narrow those options, tentatively narrow those options, or state your neutral opinion, why you think some options, based on the specific criteria that you mentioned, why you think some options you more favorable than others. And finally, it's important to, to source, uh, to, to list the sources of your information because for a policy brief, you will never have time to do original research. It's always based on secondary. So you're just based on other stuff, maybe something you research yourself or, or you know research of other people working in your field. So therefore it's very important to, to be transparent, based on what evidence you are making these statements. And that's, uh, oh yeah, so that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you in terms of some kind of experience or lessons from my experience. And when it comes to communication, I think the only way to learn it is to practice. Like when I started 20 years ago, I was not as effective in writing, in communicating to policymakers as, as I think I'm now. And so I, that's why I think rather than trying to read some kind of textbook on, on effective communication, I think the, the best way to hone those skills, this art of communication is by practice. And so if you think what would be the next how to learn more. For example, you can go to the website of one of our centers and just try to open any of the brief uh, policy briefs and try to see how effective they are. For example, if, okay, from the title of the first paragraph, can you tell what's, what's it about? And uh, so what's the problem and, what, and, and what are the solutions and, and what they do, do they recommend? And just in case some, some of you decide to, to go to the website, so just let me, let me tell you no, let you know that this website lists both long reports, full reports, as well as brief. So the first one is brief, the future of industry and employment. So some, policy, some policymakers want, wanted to know, so what do we have to do about the uh, response to the COVID? when it comes to, to, to unemployment and, and the impact on the industry. And so here you have a two page. Uh, again, the policy brief is not the only form of communication. We have other, we have full reports. There can be white papers that the government writes, but, you, but we might contribute. So, but um, the policy brief is something that's particularly specific to to the policy area, unlike full reports. So full report can be similar in structure to academic paper, but the policy brief is specific to, to the policy uh, arena. So that's all I had to share. Uh, so now I am, I would be more than happy to answer your question or clarify if I missed anything. 
And you, you need to tell me how much time you have. So I think it's already been a couple of hours, right? An hour and a half. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I'm sorry you had to be here early to listen to me, but I hope it was worth it. And I am looking forward to further collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Until we meet again. Bye-bye now.